Well, would you open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 if you need a Bible? A couple guys are coming forward right now. And they would love to hand you a copy. We're in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians is a New Testament book. A few weeks ago, we, we started in Ephesians chapter 2. And, and Ephesians chapter 2 is a before and after picture for us who are believers in Jesus Christ. It shows our life before Christ and it shows our life after Christ. And, and when we get into the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 2, we, we, we are given a very unsettling and disturbing and just bluntly an ugly picture of who we used to be. Verse 1 begins, You once were dead. Paul writes, you once were dead in your sin. That's what sin produces in our life. It produces death. And then verses 2 and 3, we, we, we get that ugly picture, that disturbing picture, that unsettling picture of what, what, what it means to be spiritually dead. You know, Paul does not give us this before picture to to cause us to sit in the shame and the pain of who we used to be. You know, some of us, maybe many of us, maybe all of us, have a history where we have a past. We have places that we can go to in our minds of who we used to be, and they're not places that we want to go. They're places of pain. There are places that remind us of deep hurts. There are places that remind us when, when we were living life in rebellion to God, in disobedience to God. There are places that remind us of the heart and heart we used to have before God. There are places that, that remind us of decisions that we made and we just cringe and we think, I can't believe I did that. And we think about decisions that brought, brought destructions into our own life and decisions that brought destruction into people all around us. And there are places that we don't want to run to again. We don't want to open up that door again. When Paul takes us to this before picture, it's not so that we sit in the shame and the pain of who we used to be. But Paul wants to remind us of who we are now. And, and, and so the ugliness of verses 1 through 3 leads us to the beauty of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, I believe one of the great verses in Scripture in which Paul says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. This is the great message of Christianity. That our testimony before non-believing world is not that one day we just decided to clean up our life. Our testimony is not that one day we just decided to get our act together. Our testimony before non-believing world is not this, that one day we found religion. Our testimony before non-believing world is that I once was dead. But through Christ I have been made alive. You know, the reality of our testimony should create a sense of urgency in us. Because our non-believing family members, our non-believing friends and neighbors and co-workers do not simply need to get their life together. They do not need to clean up their acts. They do not need to find religion. They need to be made alive. Because Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 tells us that, that when we were living life without Christ, we were dead. That was our position before God. And then two weeks ago, we, we looked at two aspects of what it means to be made alive. That we were raised with Christ, meaning we were given a brand new life, and then we were seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Our citizenship changed. We no longer belong to this world. We, we now belong where Christ reigns 
in heaven. That, that, that's, that's where our allegiance is. That, that's where our heart is. That, that's where we now belong. And so our life has changed. Our allegiance has changed. Our purpose has changed. You know, one of the things I've wrestled with when it comes to this passage is how do we walk through it without it simply just being head knowledge? I mean, how, how do we walk through this passage in which Paul is making some significant statements about who we are now and our mind just doesn't go on autopilot? That this is just Christian jargon. We've heard it. We know it. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. And I think sometimes it just becomes jargon. And yet Paul's purpose is to make a significant statement about who we are now so that we would significantly live differently. You know, if it's just jargon, it's not going to change anything. If it's just jargon, it doesn't shape at all how we live. I think sometimes we hear Christian information and then we just simply go on living as if nothing actually changed in our lives. We can find ourselves not recognizing that we have a brand new life in Christ that calls us to a new purpose in Christ. I, I think too many Christians don't understand that, that we have been made new and we have been made new for a purpose or we just simply ignore it. Because too many Christians live life in which they do not represent Christ or the very mission of Christ. And so in our passage today, Paul is going to once again remind us in some words that are very familiar to us of where our salvation comes from, but not only where our salvation comes from, but what our salvation gives us now. It now gives us a new purpose that you and I are to live out. And here's my heart, is that as we look at some very familiar words, my prayer is, is that the mind doesn't go on autopilot. That this isn't Christian jargon. That recognize Paul is wanting us to know something incredibly significant so we do not do what we naturally do. Act like there hasn't been a change in our life. And so would you read with me in Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 8. Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In verse 8, Paul brings up two significant words for us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Grace and faith. Grace is what God gives to us. Faith is our response to what God has given to us. And so in this verse, Paul is saying... Listen, your salvation is not based on anything that you have done or earned or achieved. This is a gift. This is what God has given to you. And you have just simply been given the privilege to receive and take hold of and take possession of that gift. Theologian Harold Honer says it like this. Whereas grace is the objective cause or basis of salvation, through faith is, is the subjective means by which one is saved. This is important, Harold writes. For the salvation that was purchased by Christ's death is universal in its provision, but it's not universal in its application. What, what Dr. Honer is saying is just because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he paid the penalty for our sins, and he offers us salvation, it does not mean that everyone now is automatically
physically saved. Salvation comes when you and I respond to it, when we personally, individually receive this gift that has been given to us. Salvation comes when I recognize that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. When I turn from my sin and I receive God's gift of salvation that's been made available to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, I think one of the questions that we can ask when we look at these verses is, isn't faith itself a work? Because, because I'm doing something here. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking this. I'm responding. Isn't, isn't someone doing something when they respond to that gift? And the answer is no. Not in the sense that our faith earns us anything. See, see faith isn't the reason God has been gracious to us. I, I've done nothing to cause God to respond to me. When we talk about our salvation, it is what God alone, what God alone has given to me, to you. We're simply responding. You know, when I receive a gift from my wife, my act of receiving that gift is not the reason I am getting the gift. When my, my wife gives me a gift, I, I, I am not receiving that because I earned it or I deserved it. This thing that my wife is given to me is, is what we're all recognizing that it is. It is a gift. I, I'm taking possession of what has been given to me. So faith is not the cause or the basis of my salvation. Faith is the means or the instrument in which I receive God's gift of salvation. Now when the Bible talks about faith, we're not simply talking about an intellectual belief. Faith isn't simply saying, I believe facts that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith isn't believing facts that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Faith isn't believing facts that in Him, in Him alone, there is salvation. But my intellect, my mind can believe those facts, but those facts do not move to faith or belief until I respond to those facts. Jesus said many shocking things during his life on this earth. He said many sobering things. Jesus was challenging people in their attitude toward God, that, that, that our relationship with God is not simply just rituals or tradition or just obligation. That Jesus was calling people to have an actual personal relationship with the living God. And so one of the sobering things that he said in Matthew 7, he said, just believing in the living God doesn't cause you to have a relationship with the living God. And he said this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are many religious people who know the facts of Christianity. There are many religious people who may even live the lifestyle of Christianity, embrace the morality of Christianity, but they are in fact not Christians. They do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there are many people who will die believing that they do have that relationship with Jesus, but in fact, what they had was a knowledge of him. You know, in our current language and culture, I think a better word for us to fully understand this concept of faith is the word trust. We are saved by grace through trusting in Jesus as the only one who can forgive our sins and give us salvation. That, that trust is a giving of my life to Jesus. That's how I trust him. Jesus gives us an insight into what true faith or true belief looks like. In John 3, 36, Jesus says these words. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. What's interesting 
about this verse is that the contrast to belief in this passage is disobedience. Now we would think that the contrast or the opposite of belief would be unbelief. But what Jesus is doing is he's showing us what true belief is. If you truly believe, if you truly trust, if you truly have faith, that is an act of obedience. And so the opposite of trust, faith, of obedience is disobedience. So when I respond to the grace of God by faith, I'm responding in a manner in which I am giving myself to Christ in obedience. Uh, many years ago, John Payton was a missionary in Australia. And in fact, he was a Bible translator. That, that, was his, that was his work that he was doing. And he was, he was working with a group of people called the South Sea Islanders. And he was translating the word of God into their language. And, and he got to a point where he was struggling to find a word in their language that, that really captured this idea of faith or belief or trust. Because he didn't want them to simply have this understanding that I believe something is real as if, as if I'm acknowledging the facts of something. He said he's trying to grasp what does it mean to fully believe, fully give yourself to Jesus Christ. One day he's working in his office and one of, one of the natives comes in exhausted, comes running and throws himself into a chair next to John and he says, oh, how good it is to have my full weight on this chair. In that moment, John says, I got my word for faith. That faith is putting our full weight on God. This is what faith is. I am trusting my life to Jesus and Jesus alone for my salvation. This is why Paul says, your salvation has nothing to do with what you have done what you have earned, what you have achieved. It is a gift that God has given to us. You know, if I take this chair and I stand on this chair, I've put my full weight on this chair. I, 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 I can't claim to have said, look how I have elevated myself above this stage about two or three feet. I'm bringing nothing this is all about what the chair is doing for me. Which also means I, I can't boast about anything. I can't say, look, I am actually elevating above the stage. No, I can't, I can't boast about anything I've done, but you know who I can boast in? I can boast in this chair. I can say, look what this chair is doing for me. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that your salvation is God's gracious gift to you, accomplished through what Christ accomplished on the cross. You haven't earned it. You don't deserve it. There's nothing about my salvation that I boast about. Now, the understanding of our salvation is important because it, uh, it helps us understand verse 10. A verse I think is so significant for us to understand what it means to be made alive in Christ. Because when we became alive in Christ, God says, I now have a purpose for you. I have a brand new purpose for you. Yes, you had your agenda, you had your life pursuits, you had your dreams. I got something new for you. And so while my salvation does not come by work, Michael Thomas, months after months of your faithfulness, here it finally comes. Here we go, Michael. While my salvation does not come by a work when I'm saved through Christ, salvation gives me a brand new work. In other words, works don't lead to my salvation, but salvation does lead to works. Works that God prepared in advance for me to live out. Read with me in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Now, I think sometimes when we come to verse 10, it almost feels like Paul's now starting a new thought. We, we tend to view Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 9 as this is the salvation passage and then Paul's just kind of throwing in this little comment about being God's workmanship and doing good works and it just feels like it's just this little add-on that we just kind of keep reading through. But the significance of verse 10 is that it gives us our response to verses 1 through 9. Because we have been made alive in Christ now we have a new purpose. We have a new manner in which we are to live. See, I, I think too often times there's a disconnect between our identity in Christ and how we live in Christ. We, we, we love the fact that we've been saved by grace, but we forget or even we choose to ignore that now that gives us a new manner in which we are to live. I think for us to fully grasp verse 10, we have to recognize that the emphasis of this verse is not about us and what we are to do. The emphasis is about God. In fact, in the Greek, the, the, the word his actually begins the sentence. And so the literal translation of verse 10 would be this. His workmanship are we. It kind of sounds like Yoda speak. And the reason that emphasis is important is because sometimes I think we read this verse and we immediately think, okay, there's these good works that I need to be doing. What are these good works and how do I get into these good works? But instead, the emphasis being on us, the emphasis is on this one who is the craftsman, the workman, the potter, the artist. The emphasis is that he has created us for something. We should cause us to ask the question, well, what have I been created for? What, what, what are the purposes? Well, we're going to get there in just a moment, but before we get there, I, I want us to get back to this word workmanship because it's a significant word. Now, this word workmanship isn't simply describing anything that is made by hand, but rather it, it is describing something that is made to be art. It's made to be on display. It's made to be considered beautiful. It, 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 would be, it would be used to describe a painting or a sculpture or a statue. It's describing something that, that you take delight in to be enjoyed. In fact, the Greek word for workmanship is poema. It's where we get the English word for poem. You know, when we think of a poem, we tend to think of just a form of literature. But, but, but the actual original use of poem was anything that was describing something that stirred in us something because it's so beautiful, it's so lovely, it's so magnificent. And so when we read this verse, it's not just the idea of a carpenter in his workshop just making something, but rather it's the idea of an artist creating beauty. John Piper said the point is that in a poem there is manifest design and intention and wisdom and power. The, the wind can create a letter in the sand, but not a poem. That's the point. God acted, God planned, God designed, God crafted. He created and made. And in doing that, Piper writes, Paul says in Romans 1.19, God made himself evident to all mankind. The universe is a poem about God. And so our new life in Christ is to outly reveal the beauty and the majesty and the nature and the, and, and the character of the one who has created us. And the way we do that, Paul says, is through an outward action that happens on our part. And Paul calls these outward actions our good works. And Paul even goes further and says, this is not just something you have to come up with on your own, that you have to kind of figure out, search out, figure out what are these good works. But Paul says, these are good works that were predetermined beforehand. And of course, this takes us back to Ephesians chapter one, in which Paul says that as believers in Jesus Christ, our life before the creation of the world, God had chosen us, God predestined us, and I believe at this very time, he was actually, he was actually, he was putting together those good works that we will do. 
But the challenge with purpose, when we talk about this purpose that God puts upon our life, is that we often start that question with ourselves, right? Well, what is my purpose? Well, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? It'd be, it'd be like a pot who was just created by a potter. As, the pot, as that pot is sitting on a shelf, being ready to be used, that pot begins to think, you know what, I wonder what I want to do with my life. I mean, what is my purpose? What is my passion? What do I really enjoy doing? What is my gifting? What is my calling? What, what was it that I think would really just cause me to shine and enjoy my life? That's the wrong question that the pot is asking. The, the question for the pot, he needs to turn to the potter and says, why have you created me? What was your intention when you started with that clay and, and, and you came to a finished product of me? What do you want to do with me? Oh, how do you want to use me? And so verse 10 tells us not to say, what works should I be doing? What works would make me happy? What works make me comfortable? What works fit my schedule? What works fit my gifting? But verse 10 calls us to look to the heavenly artist and say, okay, now what? Now what? You, you created me for a purpose. You had an end goal in mind. What do you want to do with me? Now, when we come to this verse, the obvious question still remains. What does it mean to do good works? And of course, good works can seem very subjective. I mean, what can seem good to you may not seem good to me. And how do I know if something is the good work that God has given me to do? And, and are we just talking about the good works that we see people doing, volunteering, helping people, feeding the poor? I mean, non-believers do that just as much as Christians do that. And so what does it mean to do a good work? Well, it's important for us to know that this phrase, good works, is not just a throwaway phrase about being nice or kind. I think sometimes that's how we view this phrase. We can even compliment someone by saying, wow, what a good thing for you to do. I really appreciate you doing that good work over there. But when the Bible uses that phrase, it's describing something significant. It's describing God being at work in us and we outwardly responding to God being at work in us. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 talks about the life and ministry of Jesus and it says, he went about doing good for God was with him. And so we see this connection between God at work or with Jesus and then Jesus responding in a certain way. And then Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine for others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So again, there's this connection between this light that is shining in us, this is God being at work in us, and us responding in a manner in which people see the greatness of God. In fact, Jesus makes a more direct connection simply between the word good and God. One day, someone came up to Jesus and they wanted to ask him a question. They said, good teacher! And they asked the question. And Jesus initially avoids the question and responds to how this man addressed Jesus. And he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And so our biblical understanding of good is not just simply that it is something that is nice or desirable or accepted, but good in the context of good works is directly related to God working in us and then being reflected in our outward response to what God is doing. And so in verse 10, Paul tells us that as Christians, we are God's workmanship created for the purpose of displaying to the world the greatness of God. But this still leads us to ask the question, so how do I know what these good works are? Because if I'm supposed to be doing these good works, then I better know what I'm looking for or know what I'm supposed to be doing. I think Jesus' words in John 15, 5 are helpful in us understanding and identifying and participating in these good works. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But apart from me, 
you can do nothing. And so we know that the starting point in participating in these good works is abiding in Christ because when we live a life apart from Christ, Scripture says you're doing nothing when it comes to the kingdom of God. I think those are pretty challenging words. I think those are pretty sobering words because, because I think there are many Christians and non-Christians think that they are doing good things for Jesus. They think they're accomplishing God's will, but in, but in fact, they could actually be producing absolutely no fruit. They may be producing no good works. You know, that word abide means to live in accordance with Christ. This, of course, takes us back to our identity Christ. We were raised with Christ. We were seated with Christ. Our life is about Christ. Or as Paul puts it, I no longer live. He says bluntly, it's Christ who lives in me. And so that anything that I do that accomplishes the will or the purposes of God must be done in a manner in which I am living according to the will of Christ. I think too many times we deceive ourselves as Christians. We, we can live a religious life, but not a Christ-centered life. We can live a life filled with church activities, but not a Christ-centered life. This is why if, if I'm going to be participating in good works that God prepared for me, I have to be beginning in the place of abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ, not just living within a Christian culture, but I have to be a person in pursuit of the person of Christ. There has to be an active relationship in which I am, am, I am pursuing him, abiding him, remaining him, seeking him, walking in obedience to him. You know, John 5, 19 is one of those verses that always convicts me. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. You know, when Jesus got up in the morning, he didn't just go and do what good religious people might do. He didn't just decide that morning, I think I'm going to teach. I think I'm going to heal. I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know what that requires? It just requires me doing whatever I want to do. Or it requires just activity. It requires an agenda. It requires a schedule. But Jesus says, that's not what I do. I only do what I see the Father doing. And you know what that requires? A relationship with the Father. It requires not living a Christian lifestyle of activity and routine and a calendar and an agenda. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, having a routine or activity. But what we're called into is a relationship with the Father in which we say, this is what the Father is doing. I am going to do the same thing. And so when we ask, what are these good works? This is what they are. Okay? They're the things that we will naturally do when we are following the person of Jesus. So, so we don't need to be trying to find these good works. They are the things that we will naturally do as we are following the person of Jesus when we say, Jesus, where is it that you are at work? That is where I want to go. And as he, is, he is at work in me, I will be doing in response to him the works that he prepared for me in advance. But here's the catch. It means that I have to be following and pursuing the person of Jesus. It means I cannot just simply be living a Christian lifestyle. You see, you can go to church faithfully every single week and not be following the person of Jesus, therefore not be living out the good works that are prepared for us. You can be in a Bible study every single week and not be pursuing the person of Jesus. You can be faithfully showing up to serve in a ministry every single week and not be following the person of Jesus. You can have the whole lifestyle and never be walking in the good works prepared for us to do. You see, these are the works that we do as we follow Jesus in what he is already doing. 
and we have the privilege of seeing him at work through us. This is why Paul says at the end of verse 10 that we the, the, created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. It's an interesting phrase. Well, why are we walking in these good works? Because what Paul is saying is these are the good works that we are doing as we exist in Christ. It's not a good work that I'm doing when I head over here to this area to specifically do this good work. It's not a good work that I do on Sunday mornings or on Wednesday night. He says when we walk in them, this is these are the good works that I am doing as I exist as one who has been raised with Christ, who has been seated with Christ, who has been made alive in Christ, who now abides in Christ. This is the good works I do as I just live out my life within my marriage relationship, within my kids, within the relationship with my neighbors, my coworkers, those I see at school, at work. This is the, these are the good works I do as I walk into a gas station and I don't know that God has prepared a moment for me right there in the produce section. Or I get to be an instrument of God's work in someone else's life because my eyes are set on the person of Jesus and I'm asking, how can I be used in this moment for your purposes and for your glory? Jesus says, apart from me, you're doing nothing. You may have a life that looks busy, religious, you may have a life that looks like a Christian should look, but he says, apart from me, you're doing nothing. God created us. God made us alive in Christ. When we respond by faith, the scripture says, we're now raised with Christ, we're seated with Christ. He says, you got purpose. You're not who you used to be. Your agenda is not who, what it used to be. Your future is not what it used to be. It says you are brand new. And when we abide in him, he's got an incredible life of being used for his purposes and his pleasure. I read a quote this past week from Johnny Erickson Tata. Many of you know her story. Uh, she was paralyzed in, in her 20s when she dove into a shallow lake that she didn't know was shallow, and she has spent her life in a wheelchair, you know, really, really only having access to her, her, her mouth, her eyes. And she says, when I look at this and I see that God is an artist who made me a new creation, I wrestle with that because God I have lived a life in pain I have lived a life where I felt most of it I have been unable to do but she says when I look at him as the artist she says who am I to say hey this is how the poem should be written this is how the painting should be painted. This is how the sculpture should be sculpted. She says, when I sit in the hands of Christ, I recognize that he will do his will to accomplish his purposes. And through me, his beauty and his nature will shine. And it may be through joy and it may be through pain. But we have the privilege of abiding in Christ and living life so that we get to be on display so the world may know him and we simply get to walk in the manner he's called us to walk as we pursue the person of Jesus and get to experience the good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been made new for a purpose Walk in it by following the person of Jesus Christ. It may just begin tomorrow morning with you waking up, spending time in his word and say, God, let me see you today. Let me see you at work and let me respond to what you are doing. Brian, I want to invite you and the worship team to come on up. And as they come up, let me, let me just pray in response to this passage. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much that our salvation is not because we did anything. 
that we earned anything, we accomplished anything, that it is something by grace. Out of your mercy, out of your love that you have given to us, provided for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we just have the privilege of responding. Of, of throwing ourselves on you, our full weight on you, and saying, I'm trusting you and you alone for my salvation. And God, I'm so grateful that you didn't just stop there, that we just walked through this life waiting for one day to experience the joy of eternity with you, but you said, I've, I've made you to accomplish my works now. I've created you as my work, as, as my masterpiece to display me to the world that is dead. Oh God, may we set our eyes on you and may we live our lives saying, I do what the Father is doing. And in that, may we experience the joy of the works that were pre-planned for us to walk in. We thank you, God, for this. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.